Matt Fry, our Europe editor. Today we're going to talk about what's going on in Ukraine and the whole debate around tanks, why it's taken so long to get them to Ukraine and what difference they'll make. What are you going to tell me? I'm going to tell you that this is a war that will be decided by two things, the motivation of the people fighting and what they fight with. And so far, the Ukrainians have been motivated right from the start to repel the Russian invader, but they've not always had the right kid to do that with. And so we have basically incrementally, sometimes begrudgingly given them what they want. And the latest installment of that is to give them the tanks that they've asked, the good tanks, mainly German tanks, but also British and American, they've asked for for months. They're finally getting them. The question is, do they get them quickly enough to make a big difference in what we all think will be a spring offensive by the Russians. So, Matt, before we sort of get, pardon the pun, tanked up on tank talk, I want to sort of remind everyone about where we are in terms of the state of the war, because we've seen the sort of ebb and flow in the past year, Russia on the offensive, then the Ukrainian counteroffensive. I mean, where are we now? Are essentially... We're stuck in a stalemate. We're in the, the Western Front, you know, 1916, essentially. Not, I mean, with, with brutality and some terrible losses, not quite as bad as it was there. But, you know, the front line is stuck. Visually, the front line looks remarkably like the front line in the First World War with deep trenches, you know, dug by both sides, a constant barrage of artillery exchanges. But essentially, as far as we know, the front line doesn't seem to be moving very much. After those moves in the south, when the Russians abandoned Kherson, after those moves in the northeast back in September when the Ukrainians took vast swathes of you know, northeastern Ukraine uh, beyond Kharkiv, away from the Russians, we seem to be stuck right now. And that's why these tanks are so important. As well as there are reports, that, and there have been reports for a while, um, from Kremlin insiders in places like Bloomberg, etc., that Putin is preparing a new offensive to regain the initiative, could be in February, March, etc. Mm. So there is the threat of the Russians who have been digging in, preparing for their own offensive. The, the people who are talking most about Putin's spring offensive are, in fact, the Ukrainians, because mm -hmm. it's part of their sales pitch or their begging pitch to get as much material out of the West as possible, and it seems to be working. Now, the spring offensive is a little bit of a cliche amongst us armchair generals, and I count you in that category <laughs> as well, Kieran. We've all become armchair generals or maybe yeah, lieutenant colonels or maybe just sergeants in the last year. <laughs> but it might actually be earlier than spring. I wouldn't be surprised if Vladimir Putin thought he could celebrate, if he was ready, could celebrate the anniversary of his special military operation, which comes at the end of February, when the ground is still hard because of winter, with another push, either onto Kyiv, which is a bit of a stretch, but is possible, or maybe elsewhere. Use the hard ground, use the fact that, you know, the Ukrainians haven't got the material that they've asked for yet. And also that, you know, many of his uh, new recruits after the mass mobilization of the autumn might now be ready to either fight or become cannon fodder on the front line. And so that's where we are. And that's why, as you say, the Ukrainians have now been asking for tanks and they have managed to get some of those tanks. And we're going to get into that now. We're talking about the Leopards in Germany, the Abrams from America, the challengers here in the UK. So that's where we are right now. And that's why the Ukrainians want these tanks. So let's get into it, because we're talking about leopards from Germany, Abrams from America, and challengers from the UK. I mean, why do the Ukrainians want these tanks? What is so good about them? The tanks they really want are the German ones, the Leopard 2. Uh, the Leopard 2 tank is a bit like, you know, the, the tank equivalent of a BMW. Or if it was a washing machine, it would be a Miele. Germans are really good at engineering. They're really good at making things that have wheels that go round, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about the Leopard 2, and I didn't know this until I asked tank experts who I trust. So this is not native fry knowledge. This is acquired knowledge, but here it is. The Leopard 2 um, operates really well, not just in daytime, but at night. It has mm -hmm. very good night vision capability. It has an incredibly accurate and powerful gun. Um, it has, you know, it, it doesn't guzzle as much gas as other tanks, so it's, it's not just cheaper to run, it's easier to run on long distances. It can travel fast. It is relatively light. It's got very good armor. 
And the way that one tank expert, Hamish de Britton, Gordon, former British tank commander, described it to me when I then mentioned that actually, hang on a minute, what's all this fuss about a few German tanks when the Ukrainians have hundreds, literally hundreds of Soviet era tanks? He mm. said one German tank is worth 10 T-72 Soviet era tanks. They're really good. Which is why the Ukrainians asked for 300 of these tanks. I mean, also some of the other ones. But they asked for 300 of these tanks. They've now been given, if we believe the pledges, maybe 135, 140. We'll get to how that works in a minute. So that's quite a big number. That makes a significant difference to the war. So if you take the Soviet to German tank ratio of 10 to 1, that's 1,400 tanks, right, roughly. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Right? So they can, in theory, they can end the stasis on the front line, can break through the Russian front line and advance further into Russian occupied territory. And, you know, you were saying, you know, the Germans are really good at making at making things. Mm. One thing I can't really get my head around is... I know is, it's is, a cliche, but it's true. <laughs> but one thing I can't get my head around is how Germany, because this is part of the conversation we're going to get into, mm. is about um, the German guilt of the two world wars, you know, and the very much not wanting to get involved in the theatre mm. of war. How is it that Germany, despite all that, in the last you know couple of decades, has become so good at making tanks? Because the so people who make the tanks, are the, they're the same engineers, sometimes the same companies that make other vehicles, you know, like whether it's trucks or cars and so on. So, that, you know, the technology, the, the science that goes into making a good tank is not dissimilar to the science that goes into making a decent car. Um, by the way, also on the price tag, you know, the Leopard 2 costs roughly 5 million euros. The, the M1 Abrahams American tanks, which is their kind of Rolls Royce of the tank world, is twice as expensive and runs on rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. they, the, the American tanks need a separate, you know, fuel vehicle that follows them behind, follows behind them on the, on the battlefield, mm -hmm. you know, like a sort of catering truck, basically, full of rocket fuel, which is, which you don't really need for anything else. So... The Americans have pledged 31 of these things, which is great. And the Germans, of course, needed that as a precondition for sending their own. And we'll get to that as well in a minute. But they're just not as good. So the Ukrainians are delighted with these leopard tanks. Now, to get back to your question about, you know, why they're so good at making them um, and what the evidence for that is. Well, the evidence is, and this is one of the strange anomalies, that there are something like 2,200 Leopard 2 tanks owned by different European countries, right? The Germans only have about 300 themselves. Mm -hmm. So when the German defense minister, newly appointed after his previous boss was kicked out, said after a, a, an important meeting of defense ministers from 56 different nations, we have to check our inventory to see what we can give away. He wasn't entirely, it wasn't complete bull. I mean, he was, they actually haven't got that many of them, but they're popular enough and cost effective enough for lots of other countries to buy them. And of course, once Germany said, we will send them, that then opened up the possibility for other countries who already have them to pledge their own or the ones in their own inventory. So Spain, for instance, mm. I believe has pledged 56 potentially. That's a lot of leopard tanks. You kind of wonder how many do they actually have? Let's briefly look at why Germany's decision to send tanks to Ukraine is so crucial for the Ukrainian military in fighting this war. President Zelensky has repeatedly said that Kyiv urgently needs heavier weapons to push the Russians back, as they currently rely on old Soviet-era tanks. Berlin is the primary producer of modern heavy tanks in Europe, most notably the Leopard 2, considered one of the best performing tanks ever to have been produced. Germany also holds the export licenses for all Leopard 2 tanks owned by other European countries. So, any nation wanting to supply Ukraine with its own fleet of leopards needs permission from Berlin. So, Germany's decision to now send its own tanks to Ukraine means others, like Poland, Spain, Finland, the Netherlands and Norway, can now also release their Leopard 2s to Kyiv. There were countries like Poland who have been calling for this for ages. What is it about Poland and those countries, you know, especially the Baltic states, that is so divided with Germany in terms of saying, this isn't an issue which we need to debate that much. Send so the, those tanks. It's a fascinating question. And I remember very well a few years ago when Radek Sikorsky, an old mate of mine from university, became Polish foreign minister. And it was actually about, it was about Ukraine, the, the, the crisis in 2014. And he said, 
We as Poles, who were conquered by the Germans in the most brutal fashion in World War II, we are desperate for the Germans to get involved, get more involved in this neighborhood, in Eastern mm. Europe, in, in, in Middle Europa and Middle Europe, because we feel more threatened, much more threatened by the Russia of today than we do by the Germany of 70 years ago. And for the Germans, this is a really complex question. And it's not entirely honest either, depending on who you speak to. So Olaf Scholz, remember, is a member of the SPD, the Social Democrat Party. This is the party of Willy Brandt. Willy Brandt was the great Social Democrat Chancellor you know, of the 70s, who then lost his position. He had to resign because his private secretary was an East German spy, Günther Guillaume. But Willy Brandt became famous because he sunk to his knees in the, at the um, Memorial for the Unknown Warrior in Warsaw. The Warsaw der, der, der Willy Brandt Kniefall. It's a big issue in German history. So this is a guy who didn't just say sorry. Hmm. You know, he didn't just tell it, he showed it. You know, he went on his knees before the victims of, of the Wehrmacht, before the victims of the Nazi empire, and said in, in the most extraordinary terms, we apologize deeply for what we've done. That was as he was a social democrat. Um, Gerhard Schröder, the last social democrat chancellor before Olaf Scholz, you know, was best mates and still is to some extent with Vladimir Putin. So, so the social democrats who were the inventors of what the Germans call Ostpolitik, the Eastern politics of engaging Russia, right? Even at the height of the Cold War, you know, let's talk them off the cliff rather than let's threaten them into submission. That is the policy, that is the history, that is the legacy, that is the DNA of that party. Does it go even further back to, I mean, the SPD is a, a very old party, which well, goes it's back 100 to the, years the old. mid, the mid it, 19th century. Yeah, so. You could argue that, you know, the, but of course, the Russia of today has got nothing to do with, you know, with workers' rights and, you know, it's not a communist party. But, but in terms of geopolitical threats, the, the, the SPD of West Germany and now of United Germany has always been particularly sensitive towards Moscow, mm. much more so than the Christian Democrats. And interestingly enough, and this is the really fascinating weirdness of all this, the Green Party, right? The Green Party was born in 1980 on an abolish NATO agenda, you know, e you know, ecological, fundamentally ecological reform, environmental reform, get rid of NATO. NATO is, you know, redundant. They said that in 1980 at the height of the Cold War. And of course, everyone thought they were mad. But that was their position. They were more anti-American than they were anti Soviet at the time. The people who've led the charge for the tanks, who, the people who've called for the freeing of the leopards from the zoo of German armament have been the Green Party more than anyone else. Annalena Baerbock, the Green Foreign Minister, I think we've discussed this before, not only has been to, to Kiev a few times, she went to Kharkiv, mm. right? Hardly anyone goes to Kharkiv because it's too close to the front line. She has been leading this charge. So the Greens who've done this journey from pacifism to you know, military engagement in Russia, against Russia, have been leading this charge. And they, of course, are part of the, of the German ruling coalition. They have humiliated, to some extent, Olaf Scholz into this you know, change of heart. You know, they are still worried, and I think Scholz himself is still worried about the dangers of escalation. What is more dangerous, a Vladimir Putin who's victorious and marches all the way into Kiev, and a Vladimir Putin who's defeated and you know, either dangling from a lamppost in Moscow or replaced by a nationalist extremist, someone even worse, or Vladimir Putin, who's, you know, the, the typical, you know, the, the Putin rat shoved in the corner does something desperate, right? That is still a calculation, which I think is completely valid, frankly. I mean, there's no proof to suggest that he won't do something absolutely nasty. We have come up with all sorts of reasons thinking why he might not, but we're not entirely certain. But do you think there has been now a sea change in how not just um, Berlin is viewing this, but also Washington, that, and this is the rumor sort of going around when you read about it, that the West now thinks Putin will not reach for the nuclear button. And that's why they are now comfortable sending tanks, because they think that threat, which we were talking yeah. about for many, many weeks and months, you know, at the end of last year, has now gone. That is a calculation that I'm hearing about as well. From, you know, my, my contacts in America, my contacts in Berlin, also in Paris, obviously London, that that seems to have receded somehow. But all it takes is, you know, one pungent speech from Vladimir Putin, and it's back on the agenda. I think in the particular German case, several things have gone on. Number one, the German public, which it was widely assumed would eventually turn against the war when they were having cold or tepid showers in the middle of a rather cold winter, 
is still on the side of the Ukrainians, massively so, but also on the side of sending weapons. Mm. Not 100%, but, you know, just over around two thirds, actually. Was that good politics then from Schultz? Because I know, good. because I think good. some people argued that the Americans were like, that's not what, we weren't pushed into this by the Germans. Well, that's what they argue. But of yeah. course, there was a conversation. You know, we, we saw, you know, Schultz talk to Lloyd Austin, the American Secretary of Defense in Rammstein just a few days earlier. And the Americans, everyone, I have to say, you know, everyone gets a lot of flack on this, but I think actually they all, they played it quite well. I mean, remember for Putin, the absolute, you know, sine qua non of all this is divide Europe, divide NATO. None of this has happened, mm. right? NATO comes through these crises. Astonishingly, an organization described as brain dead by Emmanuel Macron, you know, a year and a half ago. It comes through these divisions and crises and, and, it, and it holds together and it sends stuff that six months ago would have been impossible. Remember, I mean, they weren't even going to send anti-tank shoulder launch missiles at the beginning of the war. They send those. It makes all the difference. They send armored vehicles, which they said they wouldn't send. Now they're sending tanks. The next question is, will they send jets? Unlikely. But, and, but if you look at even the fact that they've escalated what they're sending mm. or they've you know, augmented what they're sending in terms of firepower, what they haven't done yet, and I think this is an important point, they haven't sent the Ukrainians the kind of weaponry that allows Ukraine potentially to target Russian civilians in Russian cities. Mm. Because I think they've realized, and the Ukrainians probably agree with them still, that if they do what the Russians have been doing to them, they lose the moral high ground, which they have kept in this war so far. They still have it, and we have been, and America's made this very clear, we send the weapons that allow them to defeat the Russians on their soil, but we don't send them the kind of long-range weapons that allow them to defeat the Russians on their soil. And that dividing line, thin though it may be, fuzzy though it may become, is still there. We've spoken before about the way in which Germans are taught about their history of the 20th century. Um, and we've said it before in this podcast about the, the German president, Frank Walter Steinmeier, saying on the... Um, anniversary of D-Day, saying in Berlin, you know, to, 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 to be a German patriot, to love Germany is to love the country with a broken heart, to yeah. understand its, yeah. it, its difficult history in the 20th century. Have we reached a point where that identity, which is so strong, that resistance to wanting to engage in the theater of war in Europe, mm. has that now been crossed? I think it has. And I think it was crossed, I think it was crossed some time ago, actually. Because the, the rumor was that Schultz was still sort of using this argument within debate, saying, well, because, hey, look, people don't want to see well, the, the, the Germans the, the, sending The real question tanks. is, to what extent are people, when they argue like that, to what extent are people like Schultz being, you know, respectful of history? To what extent are they expressing their, their guilt or like the collective guilt of Germany? Or are they using that collective guilt, that shadow of history, to justify avoiding difficult decisions? I suspect it's a little bit of both. Mm. And I suspect it's more the latter than the former. This issue of the tanks, it's been dragged out. It's been finally agreed upon. But that doesn't mean the tanks are going straight there. The Abrams from America won't get there till later in the year. Uh, the Leopard 2 tanks from Germany will take a couple of weeks, perhaps. We're talking about March, well, even longer. Possibly longer. I mean, Does that mean it's too little too late? I think, no, I don't think so. Not necessarily. I mean, it, may, you know, it would be too little too late if the Russian offensive that were to come in the next six weeks, if it comes that soon, were to be entirely devastating and effective. Mm. And everything that we've learned from the Russians so far, and of course, they're not telling us how many casualties they've lost, nor the Ukrainians, by the way. But if you look at how the front line has got stuck, you know, if you look at anecdotally how many people they might have lost, you know, it's not going terribly well for them. You know, they're relying on prisoners, you know, released from Russian jails to fight in the, yeah. in the Wagner group. You know, they're relying on you know, odds and sods from different parts of the world, mercenaries essentially to come in. But the argument is that they still have, of the 300,000 conscripts, they still have about half of those who they've been training up for a couple of months. So it could be that, you know. Yes. I remember at the very beginning of this war, you know, I spoke to David Petraeus, you know, yep. you know, former head of the CIA, you know, commander of American forces in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. You know, he knows a thing or two about men and kit and war. And he said the most important thing in any war, and this one especially, is are the men and women who are fighting 
motivated to fight? Do mm -hmm. they know what they're fighting for? And are they willing and motivated to fight? And with Ukraine, the answer a year in is still yes. In Russia, the answer is I don't know because mm -hmm. we don't know because they don't know what they're fighting for. Are they fighting uh, for the you know resurrection of the Russian motherland? Are they fighting to keep NATO at bay? Are they fighting to destroy an anti-Semite Jewish president of Ukraine? That doesn't make sense. None of it makes sense. And that, I mean, that I heard from very good sources in Berlin who'd gone to a dinner with Scholz that he told them, actually, the day, the night before the tanks were freed, he said to them, the German intelligence service is telling us the Russians have lost to death or injury 300,000 men. No. And the Ukrainians have lost 100,000. Now, both sides would deny those numbers. The Ukrainians never talk about casualties, you know, understandably. But the impression is that both sides are using huge numbers, losing huge numbers, but the Russians more than the Ukrainians. A lot of people I've spoken to just in the last few weeks are confident that this war will not drag on for years. They think it'll be over probably in the summer. Mm. But they also point out that if the Ukrainians are still dreaming of taking back Crimea, mm. which officially they are, forget about it. That's not going to happen because that is also a very, very red line for Putin. And that could be the thing that pushes Putin you know, into the next level of escalation. And the crucial point here is that if you can get back to the borders of 2014, even after the occupation of Crimea, you can get back to those borders as they were on the 23rd of February last year, right? So the Russians still have that part of the east, the eastern bit of Donbass, where either the population has gone, been killed, moved into a Russia proper, or the ones that are still living there are genuinely pro-Russian, right? And you regain that southern strip of territory between Crimea and the Russian mainland that allows you to have a land bridge mm. and effectively almost cuts off Ukraine from the Black Sea. If you can get that little bit, that was actually quite a big bit, but if you can get that back, you have Crimea isolated as it was before, but you can isolate it further and you can literally lock it off. You can turn Crimea into an island that is isolated from the rest of Russia and finally will be starved of resources and perhaps even willpower to be independent. It certainly stops being a summer resort for the Russian elite. And you, you, you forget about the East. If you can do that, then, then, then you know, Zelensky can sell that to his public and say, look, we haven't got all of it back, but we've got most of it back and we've got the bits back that really matter. To get to that sort of point, it's all about not just the tanks, because, you know, Ukraine says they need 300 to 400 tanks. We still don't know particularly how many they might get. We think, what, 100 to 200? At the moment, the official pledge, and pledges are one thing, delivery yeah. is another, but the official pledges, I think it brings up to 135. Yeah. So it's not everything they want. So it's all about tactics and whether Ukrainians decide to use the tanks. And that's what we have to look for in the coming... Well, of course it is. Listen, I don't know, right? But I imagine it's a, you know, where do you, where do you attack? When do you attack? And what do you attack with? Now, Ukraine has finally got its tank, so that's it then, right? No more debates about what to send Kyiv. Well, not really. Ukraine is still calling for urgent air support. And the next big question that's already begun is whether NATO should send fighter jets to Kyiv, specifically US-built F-16s. As it stands, Rishi Sunak has said the UK won't be sending any, and President Biden explicitly said the US won't either. But French President Emmanuel Macron hasn't ruled it out, and neither has Poland. And the former UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said the West needs to send the fighters. If part of this um, war, almost a year into it, has been about the Ukrainians constantly having to ask and beg for more and more from the West, and the latest example of that has been with the tanks, and they've got tanks, at least some of them they want. Is the next thing fighter jets, troops well, on I the ground? Well, I asked that question. Because Olaf Scholz yeah. has now said no. Well, not just but, Olaf but, Scholz, but I mean, I interviewed Jens Stoltenberg the other day, yeah. the um, Secretary, Secretary General, General of NATO. NATO, and he said, in that very dry, unexcitable Norwegian way, he said to F-16s, he said, no, not, not at the moment. And I think, what about later? He said, I don't think so. Now, I don't know. It might be that other jets are sent. You know, I mean, I think in the, quite a few countries, I think the Czechs and the Poles have said, we want to send our old Soviet-style, Soviet-era jets, and then you can give us some nice F-16s to replace what we've lost. You know, there's also a lot of that going mm. on. 
So I wouldn't I wouldn't rule out jets completely. I think troops is very unlikely because remember, what are we obsessed with in the West? We're obsessed after Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan. We're obsessed with getting involved in wars that we end up losing, that end up killing lots of our people that don't really know why they're there. Mm -hmm. And if you're consistent about the motivation of why you're fighting, now you could argue if this thing gets a lot worse, and I wouldn't, again, rule that out because nothing can be ruled out in this thing completely, is that if it gets a lot worse, maybe the Poles will say, well, actually, we've got more skin in this game because we're closer to Russia than you are. We're going to send people. Mm. And they might be the first ones to send fighter jets. And remember, which is also extraordinary, the whole dynamic of our engagement, whether it's with refugees, whether it's with economic aid, and most importantly with weapons, is actually driven by Eastern Europe. It's driven by the Poles, you know, and it's driven by, you know, to some extent, the Romanians, and it's driven by the Czech Republic, because these guys remember what it was like living under the Russians. They didn't like it very much. And they feel, and the Baltic Republics, as you mentioned earlier, they feel most threatened by mm. what the Russians might do. Hung, the Hungarians are an odd anomaly in all this, right? And that's because of Viktor Orban. That's another topic another for another topic. conversation in a dark place. But for now, it's interesting how Eastern Europe really is calling the shots on this. Matt Fry, thank you very much for talking to me. It's a pleasure, as always.